Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. We have been talking the last couple times I've spoke to you, we've been talking about demon spirits. And a lot of people want to know why in the world would you talk about demon spirits? Well, the, the reality is this. If God talks about it in his word, we need to talk about it. If God didn't want us to know about demon spirits, he wouldn't have told us. And the fact that he told us and recorded it for this generation means that there must be some reason we need to know. Now, I think a lot of people think that all of our battles are natural. But the battles we fight are not natural. As a Christian, your battle is in the realm of the Spirit. Now, now listen to me. The Bible says, well, let's just take a look at it. Ephesians 4.12. No, Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of what? Wickedness. All right. Now, that tells us right there that your your problem is not with the school board. Your problem is not with the government. Your problem is not with your Aunt Agnes or your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law or your neighbor. Your problem is beyond that. It is a spiritual problem and there we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against people, but we wrestle against what motivates those people the realm of darkness. And here's the good news. We win. See, that's the good news. We win. Now, a lot of people are still fighting in the flesh. And when you fight in the flesh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Some people are good flesh fighters. But if you want to always win, if you want to always win, then you need to realize that you need to drill deeper than the flesh and get to the spiritual realm. 1 Timothy 4, 11. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times, when's that? That's like right now, latter times. That some will depart from the faith Giving heed, that means that they listened to and they act upon, deceiving spirits. And, oh, I love to say this in the Greek, <laughs> doctrines of demons. Then that just get, makes you really think I'm smart when I say that. But doctrines of demons. Now, what's the word doctrine? See, some of these words we get so churchy. We don't know what they mean. Doctrine is correctly translated. That would be the word teaching. So people are listening to and acting upon teachings. They're literally being taught by demons. Now, we covered this in the last session or the one before, one of them. We talked about what are demons. Now, I have an opinion. I believe my opinion is backed up by the Word of God. But you can get too caught up in this type of thing. That's cr like trying to decide whether the 9 millimeter bullet that's entering your heart came from a Glock <laughs> or from some other brand of pistol. Well, I think it was a Glock. No, I don't think it was. No, hey, it's not about that. You're dead either way. So where demons come from 
is a nice subject to discuss. Uh, some people believe they're fallen angels. Some people believe they're disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Uh, when Genesis 6 and all of that. Uh, I have my opinion. I believe it's backed up by Scripture. But what we need to know is wherever they came from, they're bad. They're evil. They're not good. They can inhabit someone who does not have the Spirit of God inside of them and control them. They can torment people who have the Spirit of God in them because we, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. And even though a demon for a Christian cannot possess your spirit because your spirit as a Christian is already possessed by the Holy Spirit and God is the Spirit of God and God is light and in him is no darkness at all, the Scripture says, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That's Scripture. So, your spirit man cannot be possessed. However, you are not just spirit. You are spirit, soul, and body. Your body is the container that your spirit lives in. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions that actually we need to have soul control because it's your soul that affects what your body does. Your soul can be led by the flesh. Your soul can be led by the spirit. The Bible tells us to be spirit-led. But too often we listen to the desires of the flesh. But that doesn't affect your spirit as a Christian. A lost person, boy, they can be totally possessed. And Loretta and I have experienced that. We've seen that many times. You know, I had a lady in Jefferson City one time. I was up there speaking to a group of businessmen and I had a lady come forward and she wanted prayer and she told me during prayer that she'd killed her husband. She'd poisoned him and he died. Gave him arsenic. And she said, see that man over there? And there was a guy sitting in the back, and he looked all puny and sick. She said, I'm, I'm poisoning him. He's my current husband. <laughs> well, how many of you know that that's not godly? <laughs> you know, you're not taught to do that at church. That's evil. That's right. Well, what caused this woman to have this evil in her? Evil spirits. You know, uh, I'm just going to touch on something for a moment. When the devil was in heaven, originally he wasn't the devil. He was Lucifer. And he was beautiful. The Bible says he was perfect on the day he was created. Ezekiel 28, you can read it. Perfect on the day he was created. But God gave him free choice. Now, here's what I want you to understand. And this might help clear up some things. When he was cast down and Jesus said, I saw. So Jesus was there when this happened. Why? Well, Jesus is God. Jesus told his disciples, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because the Father and I were one. In Ephesians it says, the Father, the Word, which is Jesus, and the Spirit, these three are one. And just as a side note here, I've had so many people over the years say, I don't get it. How can, how can they be separate and still be the same? Well, to my daughter, Sherry, I'm a father. To my wife, I'm a husband. And to my dad, I'm a son. So what am I? I am father, husband, and son. But I'm still me. Are you following me? And, but I have three different functions. 
I function differently with my father than I do with my wife, than I do with my daughter. I treat them differently. There's actually a different set of rules for each. Somebody may say, well, I still don't get how something can be three things and still be the same thing. Okay, let's get scientific here. What is H2O? Water. Okay. So we live overlooking the lake. Uh, when we started this church, we, <laughs> praise God, we had 20 acres of waterfront. Uh, I mean, you've been to our house many times. You practically grew up there. You actually lived there for a while. Uh, but we had 20 acres, waterfront, guest house, boat dock, hydro hoist, all that kind of stuff. But it would freeze over. The lake would freeze over. We were on the main channel. You could see two or three miles each direction. You see the lake from all three sides of our house. Well, it actually had four sides. But you could always see the lake from it. But sometimes the lake would freeze over. And then it would start to thaw. And so out there on the lake, we had water, we had ice, and we had steam all at the same time. Well, what is the steam? It's water. It's H2O. What's the ice? It's H2O. What's the liquid? H it's all water. It's all H2O, but it's in three different forms, steam, ice, and liquid. And all three have different functions. You know, you can drink the water, but you can't drink the steam. Are you following me? So we need to understand that when Jesus was in heaven, he was with the Father, he was the Father, and he said he saw, now this is what he said. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, the Bible tells us that when Satan was cast out, that one-third of the angels of the heavenly host went with him. Where? To the earth, to the ground. Now, some people say, and some ancient writings say, which may or may not be right, that Lucifer was an archangel. However, that contradicts what the Bible says because the Bible says that he was a cherub. He, in, in the category of angels, he wasn't an archangel. In the category of angels, he was a cherub. Now, a cherub, uh, a cherubim, that's plural, that's the image that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. How many of you saw Indiana Jones? Okay. On the top of the Ark of the Covenant, they had those two golden angels with their wings outstretched over the Ark, and that was, they were cherubim. They were cherub. That's what Lucifer was. And keep in mind that that lid of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat, and the Bible talks about the mercy seat. That's what that is. Now, the Bible tells us, now keep in mind, I keep referencing the Bible, there's a lot of Jewish writings. Loretta has got so many books of ancient Jewish commentaries, and I enjoy reading these, but probably not as much as she enjoys reading them to me. <laughs> because, you know, we go to Florida 14 hours in a car, you know, and she, she takes ancient Hebrew and reads to me all this. I love it. I love it. But, the ancient Hebrew commentaries are not always true. It's like the commentaries in your Bible. I mean, I read the commentaries in my Bible, and from time to time I'm thinking, what was that guy thinking? Because they're just wrong. And I can prove it by the Bible that they're writing the commentary about. But the Bible, sa the Bible says Satan was a cherub. Now, his name was Lucifer, but when he was cast out and one-third of the angels were cast out, now a cherub is one of the categories of angels, okay? Keep that in mind. When, when Lucifer was cast out to the earth, at some point in time, he became 
grotesque. Now, there's debate on when he became grotesque. I personally don't think it was until after Eve was tempted. Because if he would have been grotesque, women don't like to talk to grotesque things. Uh, he was reptilian, we know that. Uh, he's referred to as a dragon many times. But he was beautiful. He was beautiful. Perfect in all of his ways on the day he was created. He looked beautiful. He had musical instruments built inside of him. Uh, Phil Driscoll told us one time, he said, he said, I don't play the horn. I am the horn. You know, well, it's, it's kind of like a guitar. You know, I could go up to my office, and I've got some guitars in my office. I could bring a guitar down here and set it up and say, this is a country and western guitar. Well, Amos could pick it up. No, it's a rock and roll guitar. James could pick it up, and it'd be some kind of else guitar. The guitar doesn't determine what it is. The heart of the person playing it determines what it is. Okay. At any rate, I didn't mean that you were a rock and roller, Amos, but man, I've heard you. You're good. All right? Uh, now, when Lucifer was cast down, he became Satan. And now, now listen to this. And the Bible says several times, he also became the devil. And he became the chief devil. Well, um, devils are synonymous in the New Testament. In fact, many times the terminology is even interchanged with demons. So if Satan... Lucifer can be cast down and changed into a grotesque being and become an evil spirit, become a devil, then why wouldn't all of the angels cast down with him likewise become devils? And there's just, I, I listened to a man last night, a good friend of mine, and he's a great minister. In fact, we have several, several of his books in our bookstore. I love the guy. He's a great guy. But... He, he gave like five or six points on why demons could not be angels, could not be fallen angels. And one of the points he gave was simply this. He says, angels can't possess people. Well, uh, the Bible says that when Judas got up at the Last Supper and walked out, that Satan himself entered into Judas, possessed him. There you go. An angel, a devil, entered into him. But don't get so hung up on that, and if you don't agree with me, don't get so hung up on it that once again, you're, you're start, starting to discuss about what color the arrow is that's coming at you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the, if the violin's tuned on the deck of the Titanic. Let, let's get with what's important. The important thing is, is you have authority over them, and the problems you have in life most generally are demon-sourced. You may not think so, but they are. And most people you know that are jerks, are just being ruled by jerk demons. I've actually been around people who've had the devil cast out of them, and they began to be nice. Do you remember the story? We just read it a couple weeks ago. The madman of the Gadarenes. He had thousands of demons within him. The guy ran through the tombs of the city naked. Get that picture out of your mind. Naked, terrorizing the community. They would chain him up and he would break the chains. And what happened? When Jesus cast the devils out of him, the people came up and they saw the man sitting down, fully clothed in his right mind. 
You get rid of the spirits that are causing problems, and most of the problems will go away, even if the problem is a person. How many of you have had problems with a person? And for those of you who did not raise your hands, liar, liar, pants on fire, we're going to have an altar call for liars at the end of the service. <laughs> We've all had problems with people. Look, in Mark 16, 9, it says, Now when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. How many of you know who Mary Magdalene was? I mean, she was someone who supported Jesus' ministry. And that's at Mark 16, 9. She supported Jesus' ministry. She traveled with Jesus. But what about her? He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, of whom he had cast out what? Seven demons. Did he curse her? Did, did he curse? Did, did he constantly interview her, telling her all she had done wrong? No, the scripture basically tells us the demons were cast out. And when the demons were cast out, she became a supporter of his ministry. And that's where McDowell, that's where she was over there at McDowell. At any rate, uh, all right. Luke 9, 1, very familiar scripture. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over what? Demons. And to do what? And to cure diseases. You will find that these two things run together in the New Testament. They run together. The scripture says Jesus entered every town and every village, healing all who were sick and oppressed by the devil. The chief demon, the devil. Now, when the Bible talks about the devil, you've got to understand that the devil, unlike God, the devil Satan is not omnipresent. He, can't, he can only be at one place at a time. And many times we say, well, the devil did this to me. Oh, yeah, like out of 7 billion people on the earth, the devil woke up this morning and decided that you were his most important target. Now, see, here, here's the whole deal. Most of us are dealing with low-level devils. Now, ZZ, stand up, wave at everybody, ZZ. ZZ just got back from Ghana, and I saw you on the Internet. Man, you were preaching. You were one preaching machine. I saw you laying hands on people. I mean, you were ministering. I, I don't know how many times you ministered, but it looked like you ministered a lot to a lot of people. But most of the devils that you're dealing with here are just ones that couldn't make it in Ghana. <laughs> Places, that's where the real demons are. Are you following me? And we take everything so serious and so personal, and everything could be so easy if we just understood that Jesus has given us authority over all the power of the enemy. But we struggle. Most of us are struggling with little itty bitty demons. I cast you out. And that little demon goes, no, you can't. And we run. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at another scripture. Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. That's not talking about snakes and little things that crawl around on the ground. Yes, it does, but that's metaphorically. Snakes and scorpions, 
It's talking about demons. Demi over the power of the enemy. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over what? All the power of the enemy. How much of the power of the enemy do you have authority over? How much authority, how much, how much of the enemy can you trample on? See, and we need to understand there's, <laughs> there is no demon, even Satan himself, that is strong enough to overpower the authority that you've been given. So it doesn't matter if you're dealing with an itty-bitty little demon or if you're dealing with a huge demon. It doesn't matter what it looks like because we don't walk by what it looks like. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And nothing by any means shall harm us. So what do we have to fear? Zero, zip, nada. We have nothing to fear. So when something comes at you, you need to understand that what's coming at you is just a reflection or the image that what's behind it wants you to see. And whether it's physical, emotional, financial, family matters, regardless, you have authority over all the power of the enemy. And too many people are speaking to the mountain and telling the mountain to move, and then when they don't see it move, they nullify what they just spoke with their mouth and say, well, I guess it didn't work this time. Maybe I need more prayer. Maybe I need to do more works. Now, I'm not saying that praying is not good. We do need prayer. But prayer cannot become a works. Fasting cannot become a work. It cannot be something where you say, well, you know what? The church has got a prayer tower. If I can just get over there to the church and have Shelby let me in that prayer tower so I can pray for two hours. No, this is really a bad thing. Three hours. I'll go in there and pray for three hours. And so you go in there and you walk around and you go yabba dabba do and all that. The whole thing is prayer is good and it's good you're doing it, but you don't get the result by your works. You get the result by your faith. You get the result based upon what's in your heart, not what you do. And that's about like somebody saying, well, man, I need a miracle. I better give $10,000 to the church. Well, that's great. Give $10,000 to the church, but you can't buy a miracle. I mean, that's, that's a type of work. Are you, are you following? Now, here, here's the whole thing. What is the work that we must do? You know, the, the disciples, they heard Jesus say all the time that work while it's still daylight. You know, tomorrow's coming. You can do the work. Finally, finally, they came up to Jesus and he said, okay, okay, okay. What is the work we're supposed to do? You keep talking about all this work we're supposed to do. What is the work we're supposed to do? And Jesus said, here is the work that you must do. Believe. Donnie, correct me if I'm wrong or don't. <laughs> but believing is difficult sometimes. And it's, it's, you know, there's only one fight. There's only one fight that Christians are told to fight. In all of the New Testament, one fight. Fight the good fight of faith. It's the only fight we're told to fight. We put on our armor, our helmet, our breastplate, got our shield, shoes. We're all girded up. We're ready for battle. What are we going to fight? You're going to fight the good fight of faith. What is faith? Faith is believing. Believing what? Believing that God has done what he said he would do. It's that simple. Mark eleven twenty two. 22, Jesus said, have faith in God. 
just before he said to speak to the mountain, the words out of his mouth just before he said that was have faith in God. It can also be translated have the God kind of faith. In other words, believe God. Paistos, the Greek word for faith, is also the same word in the New Testament, the very same word for trust. So every place that faith is used, you could also insert the word trust. So when Jesus said, have faith in God, a correct translation would be he was saying, trust God. See, and if you trust God, if you trust the Father, then you have no fear because fear and faith are opposites. I remember one time uh, years ago, I can't remember exactly where it was, but uh, there was a, a little boy, and I assume he's, what, a couple years old, something like that, two or three, and he's standing on the, the father stood him up on the edge of a table, and the father stood right in front of him and said, come here, and the boy just leans over just that far, just leans over onto his father's chest. Father backs up a little bit and says, come here. He said, trust me. He's talking to the kid. Trust me. I'll catch you. And the little boy goes, and he just put his hands at his side. It wasn't like this. No, he, just, he just, with a smile on his face, he falls over, and the father steps up, just one step, and catches him. Father steps back about two steps. And he says, come on, trust me. And the little boy, it became a game then. So he just closes his eyes, and he starts to go like, hey, what, what's the deal? He knew. There was no fear involved. He knew his father was not going to let him hit the floor. Wasn't going to happen. And the little boy goes like this. So the father sets him back up on, the, on this ledge, on this table again, and he turns around to tell somebody, you need to watch this, watch what I'm doing. He turns around and starts to walk away, and he gets about like this, and the little boy's up there, and he goes, <laughs> I mean, it didn't matter if his father was standing there and he saw his father or not. He knew if he went forward, his dad was going to catch him. And so he started to lean forward. Somebody yelled. The dad turned around, ran up, and caught him. Well, you know, we need to have that kind of faith, that kind of trust in our father. We're standing there, and it looks like we're going over the edge. How many of you have felt like you're going to go over the edge? Once again, we're going to have another altar call for liars here in a few <laughs> moments. Okay, so you feel like you're going to go over the edge. We should be like that little boy and just go, I know God's going to take care of me. And just step out in faith. Walk by faith. But see, most of us don't want to step out on faith until we see the safety net. Okay, put a net down there. Put a net. That doesn't sound right. I've got a lady that uh, my family owns some boat businesses here at the lake. And the bookkeeper for the boat businesses, her name is Annette. And I told her that Jesus didn't like her because when he was in the boat, he said, throw a net overboard. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, so we don't want to step out in faith unless we see the net. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. We, we, we trust God whether we see the net or not, knowing that it may not be the net that saves us anyway. See, we, we limit God. We say, well, God, you know, here's how I need to get out of this mess that I'm in. You have Got to let the bank approve that loan. If they don't approve that loan, I'm just going, I'm going, I'm, I'm going under God. And, and I've made the application. Oh, God, they make them approve that loan. I've got to have that loan. Oh, God. And God's saying, just don't say that. Just say, Father, deliver me. Yeah. See, we're, we're telling him how to deliver us. It may not be that loan. He may have something else. 
I was so I remember a situation a few years ago where a person needed several thousand dollars and they went to the bank and got it. Later, a person said, you know, I was just going to give it to you, but you got that loan, so I knew you didn't need it then. <laughs> See, sometimes we step out and try to fix stuff ourselves in the flesh because the enemy is warring against us in the spirit, and God is saying, trust me, have a little faith in me, and I will deliver you. I will deliver you in a way you don't even know how you're going to get delivered. You know, the first book I wrote was God's Plan for Handling Stress. Just a little book, 60 pages. And that book was a result of a situation that Loretta and I were in about 35 years ago uh, where I needed some money badly. And if I didn't get this money, we were going to go under. We'd had a man that worked for us, and uh, we trusted him. And he had embezzled $140,000 a month for about two years. And so our company that we owned at that time, it was in, in another state. It was a factory. And uh, things really looked bad. And some guys got together, uh, actually three guys got together, two of them, you would recognize their companies, and they had planned to make us go bankrupt so that they could get all this land that our factory was on because the land had gas wells, and they wanted those bad. And we had to come up, Loretta and I and our family had to come up with a lot of money real quick. And I remember telling Loretta, I said, you know, if, if I were to win the lottery or Publishers Clearinghouse, which <laughs> one, of, one of my friends was one of the executives in Publishers Clearinghouse, and he's in prison right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I remember telling her, I said, you know, if I won a million dollars in the lottery, it wouldn't help. I mean, that's how far gone we were. If I had, if somebody gave me a million dollars, it would just be one more million dollars that would be taken because it was not enough to cover what needed to be covered. And I remember people were coming to our house. Your parents were coming to our house. You were coming to the house and you and Robbie would go watch TV or something. <laughs> but but uh, we had Bible studies at our house. And people would come to the Bible studies and I know what they were thinking you know, this is really a good Bible study. Larry and Loretta, you know, they're, everything's going perfect in their life. Not knowing that we had a factory in another state that was getting ready to go, go so far south, we were going to lose our house, we we're going to lose our car, we we're going to lose everything. And it was a matter of days. And I remember telling Loretta, I feel like I'm in a stainless steel room that is welded shut. It's got stainless steel ceiling, floor, sides, everything. And it's not that I can't get the door open to get out. I can't find a door. It was one of those situations where I would like to tell God how to get me out of this, but I couldn't figure out a way he could get me out. You, you know what I mean? I, I, it was like, there's no way out of this. We're toast. We're done. And that went on, some of that legal stuff went on for a few years. And I remember one night, we're in bed, and I looked at Loretta and I said, you know, Loretta, we started out with nothing, and God gave us all this, and we can have it all again if God wants us to. All of this, it's just stuff. Doesn't matter. Doesn't even matter. I'll tell you what. Let's just have a good night's sleep, and you'll just see what happens. And I rolled over that night, and I had a good night's sleep. I said, if the devil comes and takes it all away, you can't take it with you anyway. Our treasures are laid up 
in heaven. You know, Bill Gates dies and a poor man in the gutter dies. They both enter into the next world with the same amount of stuff. So, but here's the deal. God delivered us. In fact, he delivered us and we got out of it. We were better off getting out of it than what we were before. We were better off than if nothing had ever happened. And it's a lo- kind of a long story about how it all happened. I'm not going to tell you now, but the, but the thing is, is God has a way when it looks like there is no way. And we try to tell him how to do things when all we need to do is do what he's told us to do, have faith in him, believe his promises are true, believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, believe that no weapon formed against me will prosper, believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, believe it. Believe that we have authority over all the power of the enemy. Believe that no weapon, no weapon formed against us will prosper. There may be a weapon pointed at you, It may be loaded. It may have all the rounds of ammunition in it it needs. But that weapon will misfire. Because why? Because no weapon formed against you will prosper. And this is what we've got to understand. This is nowhere I was going today. (laughs) You'll get this message next week. But we must understand that when it comes to demon spirits, that we don't get hung up on what the book of Enoch says they are or the book of Jasher or whatever. No, 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 no. Just understand they're evil. You are their enemy. God loves you. They hate what God loves. The target on your back and on your chest is what they're shooting at. But you need to know, no fear here. I say, no fear here. You know, we, we, can, we can have the enemy shoot at us, and all we got to do is just say, is that the best you can do? You know, you cannot threaten a Christian with death. Our son, one hour into 2021, stepped over into heaven. Now, here's the deal. If you can understand and believe that what God says in his word is true, then you understand that for Robbie, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and, and, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy, and that's where we're all going to be anyway, and he knows more than any of us know right now. I wrote a book on heaven. He's probably, he could look at that book and go, I could tell dad a few things. See, if we really believe this, then all you have to do is look at the devil and say, is that the best you can do? We can walk through the trials of life with a smile on our face. It doesn't mean we like what he did. Of course we miss Robbie. Of course. But God has a plan. God has a plan. I said God has a plan. And the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter in the national elections In the weather, global warming, global, you know, when when I was in high school, true story, when I was in high school and college and university, they were concerned because we were going to have an ice age. (laughs) My son and daughter get into college and university, and we're going to have global warming. Well, here's the whole deal. God's not surprised by any of this. If God created it, God can maintain it. And that's not what we're supposed to be worried about anyway because we're not supposed to be 
worried about anything. 365 times in the Bible it says, fear not. Worry is a byproduct of fear. And fear originates in the kingdom of darkness. And you have authority over the kingdom of darkness. So you have no fear here. <laughs> I said no fear here. See, you need to be an example. You need to be an example. I mean, that lady over there, she's an example. She lost a child not too long ago. But what does she do? She's like in your face, devil. She just doubles up on what she does for the Lord. Why? Because she knows the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, he said, Abide in the word, and you are my disciples. That means you'll be his follower, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's not the truth about circumstances. That's the truth about the Word of God. All right. Did you learn anything today? Well, so did I. I learned I can prepare a message and still talk for an hour and not even get to it. All right, stand up. We're going to make a confession. No fear. No fear. Here. Here. I said no fear. No fear. Here. Here. No fear. No fear. Here. Here. Now, what is fear? Fear is anything, what is it, Romans eleven twenty three? 23? Is that where it is? Anything not of faith is sin. Anything not of faith is sin. So anytime you doubt God, you're sinning, and it's the opposite of faith, you're in fear. The doctor gives you a report. Oh! No, it doesn't mean you like the report. It doesn't mean you do nothing. But one thing that you do do is you stand in faith without fear. Knowing that when you stand in faith, believing God, he will do what he said he will do. Everything that you receive in the scripture is based upon what you believe. If you want to be saved, how many of you are saved today? You're born again. You know, if you're, if you're not, the scripture says all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believe that God raised him from the dead. Confess it, and you'll be saved. Do you believe he's the Son of God? Do you believe God raised him from the dead? Then say so. Say, I believe that. I believe that. Well, if that's true, you're saved. Well, how did you get saved? By believing. Jesus said, for God so loved the world. Jesus said this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sent his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. See, there's the qualifier. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But here's what we got to understand. Everything that's promised to us. What's promised to us? Eternal life. How do we get it? We believe. Everything that's promised to us is received the same way. By believing. There are people who don't get healed because they don't believe that God's the healer. And then they rely 100% on medical. I'm not saying that anything is wrong with medical. It's not. We all have trips to the doctor. But the reality is this. Our faith has got to go beyond the doctor. Our faith has got to believe that the healing comes from Christ. The healing comes from him got emotional problems you can be healed grief problems you can be healed but you got the first step is believing that you can and believing that he will and receiving it so God's good father in the name of Jesus we give you all the glory 
We love you, Father. We praise your holy name. Bless these, your people. I plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation. I thank you that there will be no accidents, no incidents, no problems on the way home. Everyone's car will function perfectly, and it will be a joyous day. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.